Ladies and gentlemen, as we move on, the best is yet to come. Born in 1949, on the 24th of October, someone must have known that he was prime ministerial material up there in Mason Hall because they named him Keith Christopher Rowley. That sounds like a prime ministerial name. He was raised by his grandparents, prominent farmers in Tobago. So when people say PNM don't like farmers, our political leader came from farming stock. And he's still a farmer, I'm told, a registered farmer. <laughs> Tell Vassan, take that. He went to Bishop's High School and outperformed everybody. So they had to award him a scholarship. And he went to the University of the West Indies, Mona. And he did so well. He graduated with first class honors and moved on to graduate with his doctorate. Ladies and gentlemen, this son of the soil first ran for political office in 1981 and contested the Tobago West seat. Today he holds the distinction of being one of the only members of the PNM and certainly in Trinidad and Tobago to have contested a seat both in Tobago and in Trinidad. <laughs> Dr. Rowley has served Digo Martin West as the member of parliament since 1991 and in every election he has whipped them continuously as they come. He first entered Parliament as an opposition senator in 1987. So this son of the soil has given most of his life in political service. He served as several ministries as minister under the Patrick Manning-led government. And in 2010, became leader of the opposition and political leader of the PNM. He led the PNM in 2015 to victory to defeat the very wicked UNC government and today is leading Trinidad and Tobago along a path of growth and development. Join me as we welcome in La Hokita, the leader of the PNM team, the political leader of the People's National Movement and the seventh Prime Minister of Trinidad and Tobago, the Honorable Keith. Christopher Rowley. Mm, yeah. Never let your problems get you down. Stay focused and hold your ground. Because what do kill you should make you stronger. So my problems is like steroids, boy. I get my doses from all kinds of sources. And all know them still can't kill me now. You see, I them sink me on that. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. Thank you very much, party members, supporters, fellow citizens gathered here tonight in Laoketo. Chairman of the People's National Movement, Mr. Franklin Khan, other party officers, including our deputy political leader and opening batsman tonight, Senator Rohan Sinanan. Coming at one down, lady, vice chairman, member of parliament for Maloney, Aruka Maloney, and minister of planning and development, my other parliamentary colleagues, members of the Senate, chairman of the Tunapuna Piaco Regional Corporation, Councillor Paul Leacock and his team, the executive, the executive of Naoketa Talparo, I recognize you tonight, holding the fort and all the tens of thousands of you listening around the country because we are on media going live to the, to the national community. Ladies and gentlemen, as I listen to the presentations of Senator Sinanan, 
And Mrs. Camille Robinson Regis, I feel proud. Amen. I feel proud to be the leader of a government that can speak to the people we lead in this way and truthfully in this way. But I've been around a long time. And when you've been a long, around a long time like I have been, I think this year would make 32 years I've been in public life, functioning at the level of the Parliament of Trinidad and Tobago. Some things happen to you that stay with you. And tonight that I'm here in La Hoqueta, after a question was raised in the Parliament last week about how much the government has contributed to the family of your MP in seeking to save his life and to try to give him a chance at recuperation. And the figure is not insubstantial. It's a significant amount. And it was asked, I believe, with the expectation that it would somehow hurt or embarrass the government or me and the government. But let me tell you a little story. Because this country has a very short memory, but some things happen that stay with you. And some of you young people may not even know what I'm talking about. In 1991, I ran for office for the first time under the Patrick's. For the second time, I ran under George Chambers and I ran under Patrick Manning. But we won in 1991. And a new seat was created in Central Trinidad called Karani Central. It's Karani Central. And a fellow called Winston Ali, an accountant, I think it was, gave up his profession, gave up his job, and came to run for that seat, offering himself for public service. He did extremely well as a candidate, came within a few hundred votes of winning that seat, but he didn't win. We got into government, and Winston Ali, a former PNM candidate, was out there looking for a job. And all the PNM government and PNM MPs were afraid to find a job for Winston Ali because we were afraid of what the opposition would say, that we give a PNM candidate a job. But here was a citizen who had given up all that he had worked for and offered to serve the country. It was a contest. He didn't win, but he was available to serve his country. Two months, three months passed, and Winston Ali was there, knocking from pillar to post, trying to find the job. He had two small children. And you know what the end of the story is? In a fit of hopelessness, Winston Ali poisoned his two children and his wife and himself. Remember that story? He left this earth, took with him his two children and his wife. And you know what the opposition said to us then? All they used the man, and when he wanted a job, all they didn't give him a job. But it was fear of the opposition saying that we're giving him a job. Why PNM ministers didn't help Winston Ali. And had we helped him, his children today might have been alive as old as probably 30 years old. And that story may never have been told. And I took a decision that day. When the news came to me of what happened to Winston and his family, I took a decision that day. And I will always do what I believe is right. And I don't care who says that is wrong. And that is why I have no difficulty when the time comes or when the time came for the government which was served by a minister where the government could have assisted to save his life and to give him a quality of life if he succeeds. That people of Trinidad and Tobago, grateful people that we are, would help Maxi Coffey and his family to survive. So tonight, 
your MP is out of the country recovering and hopefully that he will recover to a standard that he can continue a rigorous job because being a minister of government is a very rigorous job I don't know how many of you know the effect it has on your health but those who've been through it can tell you sometimes if you have hair it shows in the grain <laughs> maybe that's why I don't have any hair so you don't know how much pressure I'm under eh? but seriously public service is honorable and you are and we are a grateful people but of course you know it's interesting that all of a sudden we have to account for everything we do by people who didn't care about accountability at all last week in the senate we had to answer the prime minister traveled eight times and it cost 2.3 million or something like that oh eight times and all i will ask those who are interested in those eight trips which one of them i should not have attended because the eight trips are trips to do with meetings of the prime ministers of the CARICOM, CARICOM heads of government meetings, which happens twice a year in different CARICOM territories, or the Commonwealth heads of government meeting I went to once, or I go to Jamaica and sit down with 15 Jamaican ministers for half a day trying to pacify them from not kicking Trinidad and Tobago out of the Jamaican market, our largest market. And when that was over the next day, I had to meet with the Chamber of Commerce that was organizing a boycott of Trinidad and Tobago's products because of the behavior of those who were before us. Tonight, I can report to you that the relationship between the government of Trinidad and Tobago, the Prime Minister of Jamaica, and the Prime Minister of Trinidad and Tobago is as good as it ever was. And that the relationship between the people of Jamaica and the people of Trinidad and Tobago is as it always should be, brothers in the Caribbean Sea. That's what it is. But let me remind you, for those who want to know about prime ministerial travel, it was in the absence of the Trinidad and Tobago prime minister at a CARICOM heads of government meeting that the single market and economy was taken off the agenda in the absence of a Trinidad and Tobago prime minister. We who are the manufacturers in the Caribbean, we who are leaders in putting products in the countries within CARICOM, protected by CARICOM to keep jobs and our economy afloat, we allowed the single market and the economy, which is in our interest, far more than the interests of others, to be taken off the agenda. I can report to you tonight, the single market and economy is back on the agenda, put back there by a Prime Minister of Trinidad and Tobago. And as we work towards this goal of such great interest and value to us and the rest of our CARICOM neighbors, I go to Haiti on Sunday to continue the meetings of Prime Ministers of the CARICOM as we seek to advance towards that particular goal. So trip number nine coming up. But the joke about it is that the eight trips that I made cost less than one of Kamala's trip. She made one trip to India with a, ship, with, with a, a, a string of people. And that singular trip that was of no benefit whatsoever to the people of Trinidad and Tobago, that trip cost more than the eight trips made by the Prime Minister of Trinidad and Tobago today. Because in cutting down waste and corruption, I reduced the number of persons going on these trips. Reduced the number of ministers, reduced the number of supporting staff, and of course, in the $2 million, a significant portion is the security that is assigned to the Prime Minister. Because I'm not allowed to travel without security. But I'll tell you something else too. One of the trips I made was to Chile at the invitation of the government of Chile. Because Chile is one of our trading partners in energy in particular, energy and ammonia. 
And something happened when I got to Chile. I went to a degasification plant where they buy LNG. Turns out, on the day that I got there, a ship should have turned up from Trinidad to deliver LNG, and that was part of the high point of my visit. The ship never turned up because the LNG went somewhere else. And it confirmed to me that we didn't really understand what was happening with our energy trade. And suspicious as I was before, I came back here and worked assiduously in trying to get this country to understand our place and our role in the world economy of marketing LNG. As a result of those works, which were functioning in a cabinet where there is no a functioning subcommittee on energy. And in that subcommittee, a smaller subcommittee on this whole question of gas marketing and how much we are getting because people, you heard the Minister of Finance say that even as the grass is growing, these horses in Trinidad and Tobago are starving. So they begin to understand it. And I went in one of those eight trips to Houston to do two things. To settle a gas price, bringing together NGC and the big oil companies that produce the gas, BP and Shell, because BP, Shell, and EOG had held their hands with respect to producing any more gas in this country. Because they were saying the cost to produce gas now is not the same as producing it 25 years ago. And the existing contracts for point, 40, for point leases were coming, had begun to come to an end. And the last government should have begun to negotiate those contracts. Because if you have contracts coming to an end, you don't wait until the contract come to an end to begin the negotiation. Because if you do that, you put yourself in a situation where you have no bargaining power. Not only did they not negotiate contracts to continue the business of Point Leases to pay our bills, but they put them on month-to-month -month contract. So while you hear, when you hear them talking now like experts and giving us advice and talking about they want to come back into government and the, and the PNM is on incompetent, understand they left office not negotiating a gas price for the thing that we live on and left companies on month-to-month -month contract. So when I traveled in one of my air trips to Houston, Minister Young and I arrived. They had the decision makers waiting on us because we had NGC on one end. We, we, we were going to meet the decision makers, not the in-between men who for months couldn't make a decision. I was going to meet those who make the decision to put them with NGC because we had to have it settled and therefore we can move on. When we got to Houston, there was a thunderstorm on the runway. The plane couldn't land for an hour, so we had to circle for an hour. When we landed, we were going to be late. Minister Young and I turned up in the meeting in our, in, our, in our travel clothes. And these guys were then in their fancy suits because they were expecting a prime minister. To, and here we were. But we were on time for the meeting. And we brought NGC and BP together. And in that meeting, NGC and BP were able to close their differences and come to a point where both parties the gas aggregator in Trinidad and Tobago, owned by the people of Trinidad and Tobago, and BP, the largest producer of gas in this country, on that trip, they agreed to a gas price, which allowed Shell to come to a gas price and EOG to come to a gas price. And immediately, what was happening before came to an end, and gas production started to be spurred out again in Trinidad and Tobago. That's what happened. We got a gas price. As a result of that, $10 billion in investment is taking place now over a five-year period so that we can continue to produce gas. That's one of the trips. And among the trips, another trip we made was to Venezuela. Because I don't know if you all know that even as our gas is running out here and they say we have 12 trillion cubic feet left and you could see the day in, one, in our lifetime, if we live that long for 12 years more, where there is no gas, we could see the day when we are out of gas. 
And you think it doesn't happen? It happens, you know. Chile used to have plants like ours in Point Lisas, and eventually the gas finished, and they pick up the plant and have to go with it because there was no gas there. Britain used to have huge oil fields in the North Sea, but then you use it up because these are wasting resources. So looking at how important this hydrocarbon industry is to us, a government had to look down the road. But you had a government that wouldn't even look at a gas price that is, the contract is ending in 2018. But we look towards the future. And right across our border is Venezuelan gas field in eastern Venezuela that has no hope of coming to market anywhere in the next decade or two. So we go to Venezuela and we negotiated with the government of Venezuela. And we are that close. We are one signing from an agreement that allows us access to Venezuelan gas through pipelines, through the Hibiscus platform to Point Lisas to keep Point Lisas going into the indefinite future. Those are the kinds of trips that are made by a PNM Prime Minister looking out for the people of Trinidad and Tobago when you are in government as PNM. The most famous trip of the last Prime Minister was to go to New York to celebrate India National Day, the government of India, the people of India, while they are our Commonwealth partners and sisters, but the Prime Minister of Trinidad and Tobago goes to New York to fet to lime, to drink, and to carry on in New York. And to go to her friend funeral in Miami. And when they go, it's 10, 20 of them having a ball at public expense. I can tell you, that is not the style of a PNM prime minister. We said we will cut down waste and excesses. I'm running a cabinet that is 10 members shorter, a government that is 10 members shorter than the last government. You remember that? And that is costing $44 million less per year. And that is how you react in a situation where you are serious about your responsibility. And while it is important for the prime minister to make sure that everybody got a house because everybody wants to talk to the prime minister about a house or about who comes down the road and burn rubbish. That's important. The prime minister needs to know these things. But the responsibility of the government is separated into a number of portfolios. Each minister has a piece of the government and the prime minister has an oversight and responsibility for the whole shebang. But the most important things are the important things. And the Prime Minister, a PNM Prime Minister, focuses on everything, but more importantly, the lifeblood of Trinidad and Tobago. So we do. We are in government now, midterm, half year, and the pontificators, some of them love to put on PNM label and pretend that they're PNM, and of course they're licking up stuff left, right, and center for a dollar. Right? And they want to know why we have not diversified the economy. And since we come into office, we didn't diversify the economy. And we were in the opposition and we should have known that we are coming into government and we should have had a plan and therefore we come into government without a plan. Just drink your rum and get on my face. Because if it was so easy to diversify the economy, then they would have diversified it because they had many more years and much more wherewithal. I asked the country tonight, when the UNC came into office in 2010 and they left in 2015, what was different with the structure of the economy of Trinidad and Tobago? Point me to one thing they did in that five-year period that you could say, okay, that changed the economy or put the economy in a different direction to go along that path. Tonight, I could tell you, all they were concerned about was enrichment of themselves and their friends and their family. And I will tell the country further. I'm no small church preacher and I'm no pontificator in ecclesiastic matters. That's for the church but no minister in any government that I lead 
could indicate a semblance of operating to enrich him or herself as their function in that office and last one day in my cabinet. And they will tell you, I tell them every day, don't fall in love with this office that you are in because you never know which day you'll be asked to leave it. Ask them, they'll tell you that. And that is, my, that is my doctrine. Don't fall in love with your office. Just do what has to be done. And I have a mentor in Tobago. He's called William McKenzie. He held the PNM flag for three terms in Tobago as a lone voice. Only seat being won by the PNM in Tobago when you're out in the wilderness. William McKenzie. We call him William the Conqueror. And you know what he says? He says, in this business of public service, you can't please everybody. You try to please everybody. But you know how you do it? You do your best and leave the rest. And some of the reactions to this government is probably laughable. They are the annoying ones of those who start out by saying, I'm PNM, and I don't like what the PNM government doing. If you examine them closely, you will find it's something they wanted that they didn't get, and that's the behavior. But we, we don't see it so. Government is not about personal aggrandizement. It's about developing the country as a whole, a rising tide that is supposed to lift all boats. And there are many people who will encourage you to do things for them, even if it means that you'll bring the government down to hell with that, if they get what they want. And there are those who believe that the only thing that matters is what they personally want in the process. But we survive that. And of course, there are others these are the real jokers, what we call the uninformed pontificators. They start off by saying, I don't know. But since I don't know, I could talk on it for the next half an hour and, ex and, and, and pontificate about what should be done and what should have been done. And of course, they all say that we are incompetent and we're stupid. It's still a free country. You could think so. But I'll tell you one thing. We are not phased by that. Look at what we're talking about here now. For you young people inside here tonight, I like to speak to young people when I'm on a political platform because the work of the politician and the politics is about the future for young people. I was in Sangre Grande. One of the meetings that moved me most in the 2015 campaign was that meeting in Sangre Grande where there were thousands standing in front of our platform and we outlined to them why they should support Glenda Jennings Smith, vote for the PNM, because we have a development plan to develop your area, to bring you into the national economy, to connect you to Tobago, and to give you that chance so that a child but born in Sandy Grandi, a child born in Kumara, a child born in Toko, a child born in Manzanilla, would have the same opportunity to develop as a child born in St. James, Tobago, or San Fernando. And we gave that as a campaign promised to the people in front of us. And we said, if you put us into office, this will be our program for you. Uh -huh. The minute we start to develop the highway to go up to San Grande and to take us on to Toko, for all the good reasons that are outlined by the minister tonight and others, all of a sudden, somebody have a problem with it. I and the PNM government, we have a mandate to do that. And that's why we're doing it. We have a mandate from the people of that area to bring to them development that they deserve. And while I don't want to impinge upon court decisions, and I'm sure no judge will listen to me in coming to a decision. They will look at the facts. Because that highway is the only highway built in this country where before you broke ground, every aspect of approval was had because we know they will behave so but ask yourself a question who do you listen to in this country about matters of science and environmental protection the people that you put in law in an agency who are trained and qualified or the ones who just feel is what they want should take place whether they know about it or not 
And ask yourself, if we wanted a road to Maracas now, if we could have built it, given their behavior, don't touch this, don't touch that, don't touch this, don't that. You have a spider there, you have a monkey there, don't touch this. If we had set about now to build a road to Maracas Beach, so as to make Maracas Beach that mecca that it is in this country, you think they would have allowed you to build that road and cut those hills to go to Maracas? Ask yourself, when will the PNM become accustomed to this every time we come up with a development program that is quantum leap beyond? Who will see sit down in the road, you know, to block the highway to San Fernando, you know? You remember that? A highway to link Port of Spain to San Fernando, we had to fight who will see. They would rather have a whole tune on that. I didn't even know she had a pancake face until Pandy talked about it. Because she blocked in the highway to San Fernando. I ask you today, how many people in the country know that the highway exists? How many people in the country want it closed down? How many people can do without it? But it suits some people's agenda, ego, and political behavior to come and talk about block. Let me ask you another question. You were around when they were blocking the Colonial Highway in Tobago? The PNM was building a highway in Tobago from Bonacord out to John Dial, the Claude Noel Highway it is called. In the political arena, they decide to lie down in front of the bulldozer to stop it. Go to Tobago now and ask if you could find one Tobagonian who doesn't want the Claude Noel Highway, which is the number one road in Tobago now, taken for granted. The PNM had to fight to get it done. The same way we will fight to get the road built to San Grande, and when it's built, we all do. It is, the same, it is the same behavior where persons who decide that they're uninformed, I don't matter that I don't know, is the I don't know pontificators. We were going into a diversification of our economy to have an aluminum industry in this country. They decided it will kill people the same way the untruths about the minister have land in Komoto. I see one of the agitators Telling the country that the reason why we're building the highway to, to San Grande is because the minister has land. Now, don't wear the PNM corn in Ole Bushel. That is how Ole behave in South with the highway to, San, to, to, to Point 14. Making money for your benefit by the land deals on the route which we are still trying to unravel. But on this highway to Komoto, the route was set before we came into office. Ministers under the last government had it as part of their portfolio, albeit they didn't do anything about getting it done. Minister Hines under the PNM was the first, first minister under this administration to have been given the responsibility to go with it. And then when there was a reshuffle, Minister Hines went to the AG office and Mr. Sinanan came in, he continued it. So when did he put the road on his land? When did he put the road on his land? You understand what the kind of thing that is fed to the people of Trinidad and Tobago? By persons who are comfortable where they are, but they don't want development for people outside. Let me tell you something. Recently, something happened in this country that I'll draw your attention to. There was a, an energy conference in Port of Spain an annual conference, where the experts in energy will come and tell us about our position and the industry. We, in the budget, understanding that we are being shortchanged in the sale of gas, and we desperately need better earnings, better revenues, and what is fair, we must get. We could not get the tax that we ought to be getting from oil companies because after they finish handling their books, notice that I've used no culinary terms, handling their books, no profit of any consequence appears. So we can't get petroleum profit tax. 
So even as we are coming along, selling gas and selling this, petroleum profit tax is not available to us. It's available to them and their shareholders. But to you, the shareholder who owns it, you get in none because no profits have been declared. So we put a royalty, 12.5%, which is lower than the royalty in some places. Some places, 16%, 20%. We set a 12.5% royalty to be paid by any company that is extracting gas in Trinidad and Tobago. That way, that way, we guarantee that as the gas comes out of the well, some money will come to the people of Trinidad and Tobago. You will think that people of Trinidad and Tobago who are supposed to know will understand what we're doing? No. They try to make themselves popular and try to get consultancies from the oil companies by bad mouthing our action. And of course, standing with those who are ripping us off. So, Minister of Energy, who is a spokesperson for the government and the country on the energy matters, he goes to the energy conference and tells them and the country and the world that the professional international standards and the professional international investigators indicate to Trinidad and Tobago as a result of the work done by our cabinet in looking at what is going on with us in the energy sector that we have been shortchanged by the energy companies. And of course, that the government is aware of it and we will take on the issue with the behemoths. The first thing you hear from those who know is that the government is taking a risk, taking a chance. Because if you interfere with these oil companies, they could. So in other words, don't say nothing because they might hurt you in retaliation. You ever heard anything like that? The minister goes there and makes a case for greater earnings for the people of Trinidad and Tobago from the business that we are conducting. A speech was prepared by the energy voices to tell us that we shouldn't really be concerned about taxing the industry and getting more from, the, from, from tax drawing because we should be content with the multiplier effect because when they spend some money in the country, it multiplies because the man who gets the money from the company pays it to that one and pays to that one and then pay taxi and taxi pay the, the vendor and so on. So the multiplier effect keeps us going. So we shouldn't do anything at all to interfere with the multiplier effect. So in short, their shareholders could get cash from the industry, but we must settle for the effect. That is not going to happen in Trinidad and Tobago for much longer. Because I have sat down respectfully with the people who run these oil companies. And when I sit down with them, I don't sit down with them or I don't stand up with them in any bedroom slipper and any, and any nighty. I sat down with them across the table and say to them that we in Trinidad and Tobago are no longer prepared to accept the current arrangements where the grass is growing and the horse is starving. So while we're on the road to the IMF, if we don't, if the PNM government doesn't successfully manage this decline of the economy, other shareholders are breaking record in their earnings from Trinidad and Tobago. So you know what my position is and this government's position is? That those contracts which put us in that situation need to be reopened. And for those who felt that that was too much of a chance and a risk to take. We are only asking for a fair deal in the arrangements. And tonight, I'm pleased to report to you that at least one of those companies already has agreed to sit down with this for discussions on reopening those contracts. <laughs> and it didn't happen by us trying to be like the last government, because God knows we should be anything else but the last government. And tonight, I want to publicly thank former Minister Wendell Motley, who served as a volunteer in the subunit of the Energy Subcommittee of the Cabinet in taking this matter 
from the cabinet in 2016 to 2017, leading our team with other experts and the Minister of Energy and the cabinet for putting Trinidad and Tobago in a position now where we could talk to the energy companies in this way about that. That is what your government has been doing. So it has been doing. We have been looking for a future for this country while we have been trying to survive the difficult situation. How many of you know of a situation in the hospital where a patient comes in and is diagnosed? It is because you're a patient that you're in a hospital. It's because something is wrong with you, otherwise you wouldn't be in the hospital. And this country was put in the hospital by Kamala Posad Bissessa and her flagrant behavior in 2015 and beyond. We took over the government in a very, very difficult time. But we're not complaining. We are horses for courses. We are the thoroughbred for this difficult situation. You could imagine. You could imagine if they were in office, what would have happened? Let me tell you what they've been accustomed to. This is, this is how they were managing the country because they could have done it like that. In 2011, in this program called Program for Road Efficiency, okay, called Pure, Pure Money, 2011, they had 436 projects for $1.288 billion. 2012, 378 projects for $746 million. Money was available. 2013, 241 projects for $426 million. 2014, 778 projects for one and a half billion dollars. And 2015, 724, 367 projects for $724 million for a total of four billion six hundred and eighty nine million two hundred and four thousand dollars four point seven billion dollars in this one program pure you know how much the minister of the current minister has available to him for the year's work in this same program now one hundred and a hundred and forty million dollars so the people who had four billion dollars where they were spending one and a half billion dollars a year, is now saying to the minister who has 140 million dollars, do this, do that, do this, do that. And tonight, I, before I left home, I looked and I just shook my head. The fashion now is not patience and understanding who was raping the country, but everybody who wants something now, go and get some tire and burn it in the road. So some councillor, some two by four councillor in Flanagan Town. There's some project with a school that is being looked at by the Minister of Education and is being worked out so we can get it done because we do know there are a number of unfinished projects which we can't fund. So you know what? They're organizing through the UNC councillors, organizing to burn tire and block road and encouraging people, some of you who are so-called PLM supporters as well, encouraging you to burn tire and block road. Rather than understand that this government is on your side and that is all you have in Trinidad and Tobago. Because if you put God out your thoughts and bring them back into office, all you'll get is more of what you had from them. Let me tell you something. You know what 10% you know of 4.68 billion is? It is $460 million. That is if the bribe is at 10%. I can tell you tonight that this government has evidence of 10% bribe being taken by UNC ministers. And it's on its way to where it belongs. And what calls me is when I have to sit down in the parliament to be scolded by them and hear Wade Mark saying that he supported this and he supported that because they are the watchdogs of the public right. There is no right to thief public money in Trinidad and Tobago. Yeah. 
And that is 10% on the low side, you know. And I just asked my colleague, Senator Sinanang, whether I should share with you what he and I knew when you were in the opposition. I was home in my house. We were in the opposition as opposition leader when he called me to tell me that a contractor who was supplying a service, not a building contractor, a contractor supplying a service, was on his way to a minister's office with millions of dollars in cash with the minister. I said, and where is that going? To the minister's office. I say, and has he arranged for the police to join them there? So, but you know what the person's position was? Complain to the opposition about the fact that the ministers were shaking them down. And when I said, well, get the police involved, no, I wouldn't get any more work. I said, well, you are part of the problem. And you are the worst part of the problem. That is what was going on under the Kamala Prasad basis of government. You understand? And today the parliament want to give us advice and scolding us. We who run in this country on a shoestring. And if this government has done nothing so far, is to stabilize the sick economy and to preserve the jobs of those who depend on the taxpayers' treasury. We know that some persons are finding it very hard. It could have been easier had we not wasted and stolen the amount of money that was wasted and stolen in the last five years. But we have to make do with what is available today. The development program that we are pursuing, it provides jobs, it provides opportunities, it provides a future. Every single thing the government is going to do, their position is obstruct and delay and then have a political argument that the government got nothing done because the government is incompetent so we go to build houses in st joseph no don't touch it we go to build roads in sandy gandhi no don't touch it we got to do anything in the parliament with a law no don't touch it and they're waiting for the election to say but they will be quite right if we foolishly allow them to prevent us from doing what you allow what you elect us to do because you you will not ask us at the end of our term how much argument we had with them you will ask us what did you do during your term of office so the biggest problem this government has is overcoming the obstruction and the delay and the and of course Simple, straightforward matter in the parliament. Talk about crime. You talk about crime. We are told on a daily basis, many of you know on a daily basis, that in your communities, that there are people who have organized themselves into gangs and are operating criminal businesses. Many of them are recruiting your children, arming them and giving them the opportunity to go out there and commit violent and murderous crime. And if you as a parent even say, boo, they take you too. So they are silent. And their community is controlled by people who organize criminal arrangements for profit. And yet, after they vote down the anti-gang bill in the parliament, they go down to Debe and have a meeting like this and tell the people the reason why they voted against the bill in the parliament is because we don't need anti-gang legislation because there's no evidence that gangs are the cause of crime in this country and i watched ramdeen this morning on television after he said that in Debe on television this morning they want to help the government pass the law all they had to do was to say yes in the parliament and we get all the help we need you voted down in the parliament, but coming now and moving heaven and earth to tell us it needs a tail, it needs two ears, it needs a, a saddle, that's, that's, that's a carry on. As if you're too stupid to understand what happened. 
because they do not want the government of Trinidad and Tobago to have any opportunity to bring the crime under control because if the crime is brought under control what the hell are they going to talk about after that is the election campaign Ramdi is there this morning since the PLM came into office thousands of persons have been murdered yeah a thousand a thousand person was murdered since we were in office for 30 months but what about how many thousands were murdered when they were there when pande was in office they had a murder in the prime minister house remember that story inside the prime minister compound two persons were killed and of course when mrs kamla Prasad basis came into office the singular thing that her government is distinguished for is the speed with which they dismantled the national security establishment. They dismantled every God in heaven thing that the police and the security services had that was meant to fight crime. They even sell the blimp for $50,000, cost $14 million. They gave it away. They shut down sort. They dismantled this, they dismantled that. They fired all the trained officers in sort. They fired Brigadier Joseph and said he was spying on the Prime Minister. Lie. All of these things happened. And of course, they put Reshmi Ramnarayan to run the SIA. And today, after we have come in 30 months, we have strengthened, reorganized, and put new legislation in place to create the SSA which is effectively functioning in gathering information to assist the police. Because let me tell you something about the police in this country. Whatever we might think about the police, and I dare say that there are some people who shouldn't even pass near a police station except they're going inside, <laughs> who are in the police service. But we do have a body of men and women in this country who put their lives on the line every day in defense of all the people of this country. Every day and every night, they put their lives on the line. Their families send them out. And when they come back home, I'm sure they breathe a sigh of relief. Because the job is a dangerous one. Because there are people in this country who would kill you for an orange. That is what our country has become. And as we do that, we want to give them every opportunity to get the upper hand of persons who have chosen criminal conduct as their endeavor. So those who want to come and tell you they want to help the government, you're not helping the PNM because they behave as though they're doing something for the PNM. Crime fighting is not for the PNM or for the Prime Minister, it is for the people of Trinidad and Tobago, all the people of Trinidad and Tobago. So if they want to be true to their oath of office, they will take a decision, as the law requires, to join the government in giving the police another tool. And they're confusing you. you we have other laws. What do you want anti-gang legislation for? Well, if that was so, what did you want it for when you brought it? You must remember, it is they who first brought it. In 2011, they brought that law to the parliament saying, we need to make gang activity, recruiting for a gang, being in a gang, a criminal offense. Not, the, not what the gang does. What the gang does, whether they shoot, they kill, that is already covered by the law. But just being a part of a gang, organizing a gang, because gangs are organized to do bad things. And so if you are a gang leader and you're recruiting for a gang, that ought to become a criminal offense. But you must have the evidence to prove they didn't care about that. We worked with them in forming the law. Marlene McDonald, Colin Mimbert, they came to the parliament and they praised both of them in the committee for, the, for their contribution in bringing the law to the parliament. And every PNM member voted for the law. And at the time, the law had with it a loss of bail for 120 days. And many of those criminals were afraid of that. Because if you were caught in that situation for 120 days, you were in jail. So that was a violation of their fundamental rights. So we said, okay, we will, they said what the sunset clause, meaning this law wouldn't be on our law books forever. It will be there for five years. And after five years, we'd look at the law again 
and extend it again if the circumstances warrant it. Well, the circumstances surely warranted it. Because after five years, the gangs were still there. And they were growing. And you know why they were there? Because eight days after we passed the law in the parliament, they declared a state of emergency and lock up a set of people with no evidence. They might have had information that some of those persons were taking part in gang activity, but information is not evidence. And therefore, when you act so purportedly under the law, and then you go to court with no evidence, what happened, people? The director of public prosecution came to court and threw out all the cases because there was no evidence. And instead of hanging their head in shame, they're coming to advise us now and telling us about the one statistics and the one statistic. And Wade Mark and Ramdin are the spokespersons in defense of the people's right. In other words, they're afraid the PNM and the police more than they're afraid the criminals who are killing you left, right, and center in your streets and in your homes. That's what they're telling you, you know. That's what they're telling you. But all they're concerned about is how they could use this unfortunate development in our country of runaway violent crime as a political tool to get back into office to thief. That's all it's about. So they will not have a good word to say about this PNM government. But I'm not of that metal. My record will show that I voted for a budget brought by Kamla Prasad Bissessa. I'm the only opposition leader in this country. I'm the only opposition leader in this country that led an opposition team to vote for a budget brought by the government of the day because it was in the interest of the people of Trinidad and Tobago. <laughs> and let me address another issue which has reared its head and must be spoken to immediately. Our security services, in case you don't know, that the SSA that looks for at people and particularly those people whose intent is to harm the citizenry. Some of our citizens are bad people and they will do bad things if given a chance, whatever they are, whoever they are. So every country, every state has a requirement and in many instances an ability to monitor those persons who could harm the society. We have the SSA. It's cost us about, it's almost $300 million a year or thereabouts to run that. The job of the SSA is to look at for and be interested in persons who could harm our society. We have a defense force. We have a police service. Their job is to secure the citizenry and to be alert to those who might harm us. So when information and evidence, as it might be, comes to the government that there are persons whose interest might be to harm us, the government is duty bound. And the security services that are not directed by the politicians, eh? in our country, the police commissioner is in charge of all the policemen. Prime Minister, as I am, I can't tell a constable to move. Can't call one unless I'm calling him as a citizen in, in trouble. Can't call him as Prime Minister. Because in our system, in our constitution, the securing of the state is protected under the office of the commissioner of police, chief of defense staff, and so on. When it comes to the government attention or the police attention or the defense force attention that the citizenry is in danger, we expect that they are duty bound to take the necessary action regardless of who the citizen is. I've heard it said in recent days that we are persecuting Muslims because the security services have picked up people and is investigating allegations of threat and misconduct of persons who may or may not be Muslims. But let me tonight, as Prime Minister of Trinidad and Tobago, speak to all the people of Trinidad and Tobago and to the world that there's no policy and has never been any policy in Trinidad and Tobago 
to persecute or prosecute anybody based on their religion. It is our anthem that says in this country, every creed and race finds an equal place and we are equally exposed to law enforcement if our activity attract the interest of law enforcement. It's a dangerous argument to be propagated in this country that if law enforcement comes and investigates a matter or apprehends a citizen, that that person could invoke their religion and say, it is because of my religion why this action is being taken against me. If we begin to go down that road, that is a road you never come back from. Once you begin to go down that road, you never come back from it. I know of no example in the world where people have gone down that road and have turned it around. I have seen in Northern Ireland where Christians, one group Protestant, one group Catholic, and their children, toddlers going to kindergarten school, being escorted by soldiers because one group of Christians want to kill the children of another group of Christians. That is what religion does when you bring it involved in politics. And if out of fear, and I'll tell you something, nobody in this country is above the law. If the security services have information that you have criminal intent or you've created criminal conduct, you are open to the security services to protect the rest of the country regardless of whether you're Muslim, you're Hindu, you're Christian, you're Baptist, you are a citizen of Trinidad and Tobago. And by the same extension, you have the full protection of the constitution where if you are acted against and you are wronged, you have the protection of the courts that sees no, no religion in this country. So let's start with that. Let's end with that. And the Muslim community in this country has been a very peaceful and productive group. But the world of 2017 is not 1967. It's not 1997. We do know that some of our citizens have attached themselves to foreign doctrines not of peace and love, but of violence and hate. And let me say one more thing for those who believe that if the security services apprehend a Muslim person, that it is because there is some, 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 some madness that has taken over the, the security services. Let me remind you all that we are the only country in the Commonwealth, in the Western Hemisphere, and possibly the world, as a small island nation, where you wake up one morning and hear that a small minority of people under religious persuasion have overthrown the government, bomb the police headquarters, and blow up the parliament too. We experience that. And we hope that we will never go back there, but it's part of our history. And I'm saying to you, do not listen to people who in our time of difficulty will seek to use mischief as their way of having their 15 minutes of fame or to get a picture in the papers or to get a name on the, or to get, get a voice on the radio. We are going through serious economic difficulty, understood by many, but there are some who aim to prosper by peddling foolishness because it, it works for them. What works for us as a people is a government that is aware of our circumstance, has the wherewithal to do more with less, and to protect what little we have as we seek to grow it into more. That's what works for us. And in so far as law enforcement is concerned, what works for us is to hold our police services and all our security services to the highest possible standard, and to give them what we can afford. Because in some instances, we can't afford some of the protection we need, you know. Under the last government, they were flying around in four Augusta Westland helicopters. When they canceled the OPVs, because they wasn't going out in the sea, but they were going up in the air, they kept the four helicopters. Those four helicopters were costing us in maintenance $200 million a year, paid to a foreign company. This cabinet took a decision to look to see what was the contribution to crime fighting of those four helicopters. Were we getting $200 million worth of contribution? And the answer was no. 
And I took a decision to take to the cabinet and the cabinet agreed that we should ground those helicopters and not spend $200 million in maintenance on them. We can do something else with that $200 million. But of course, one of the helicopters was outfitted as an air pram. <laughs> and the prime minister stopped on the ground, up in the air, back and forth. I can tell you today, I have been prime minister of this country for two and a half years. I have never set my bottom in a helicopter in this country. And the country has been well run ever since. $200 million a year in maintenance in one little arm of the, of, of, of the security agencies. They brought 12 vessels here for the elections. Remember the vessels? All on trust. You know, just trust things. Remember the old Chinese shop? You go, right. Those vessels came here on trust. When they had money spending in the way I just told you here, four and a half billion dollars in road paving, they didn't pay for the vessels. We, with three days' money left in, to run the country, we have to pay for it. And we are, and we have paid for them. On going out through the door, they gave public servants a 14% increase, a contract to pay them a 14% increase, knowing that the key was securing their jobs rather than the pay increase. And we, as a government, we paid half first, and we paid the other half after, because it was a contract between the workers in the public service and the government of Trinidad and Tobago. Five billion dollars we had to pay in back pay. And even after we paid that, we have secured the jobs because we have had no policy of sending home gazetted public servants. Not a gazetted public servant has been sent home as part of government's austerity program in this country. Not one. Of course, there are those who make a living walking up and down and talking about this one going on the breadline, that one going on the breadline. Because it suits them to say that. Of course, there have been some loss of jobs here and there. Because in this scenario, you have to make changes and adjustments, and it does affect some people, and we are aware of it. But we have also created opportunities. In the actions that we have taken, many opportunities have come the way in this country. We have three contractors now working on the, the, the project to Point 14, all local. What about the jobs created there? We have four more contracts coming up on that road. Jobs again. The $221 million package here, the two of them, $400 million worth of road construction in this depressed area of the country. Jobs again. We're talking about a port in Toko. Jobs. We're talking about a, 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 a coast guard station in Toko. Security. We're talking about tourism. The north coast of Trinidad and the channel across to Tobago and Tobago is part of our heritage that could help us to do something differently in the economy. We talk about a sandals project in Tobago. They don't want sandals. In Jamaica, the Jamaicans have a statement. They say, want you, want you have a, you know, have you, have you have a habit of telling want you, want you what to get? <laughs> right? So all of them are very comfortable. There's one particular one. My mother and her friends buy so much cloth from him that he and his children have to work again in life. But he know that you mustn't get this and you mustn't get that here. And lie. We are building a highway even further away than the train line. For the people of San Grande, every evening you go into San Grande, you join the traffic in Valencia. And you take hours to get to your house, to get into San Grande. You think they care about that? They get home, go over tree, go grow where they're living, you know. They cut down the guava trees from there and build their house. They're happy with that. They have everything where they are. But they want to leave down there to come and tell you here what you must get and what you mustn't get. Tonight, I want to say to the people, the same thousands of people who stood before me in San Grande that night and say you want the development that the PNM will bring to you, where is your voice when this is happening to you? Where is it? You, you remain silent and they'll prevail because they believe that because they don't know, it doesn't exist. Because they don't want it, it mustn't happen. That is their approach. But of course, you know, they will tell you, because their repo savannah is there, know how he must pass. Go to Tobago. 
the oldest nature reserve in the western hemisphere is in Tobago. How many of you know that? The first piece of land in the western hemisphere is the main ridge of Tobago, so declared in 1776 to be a nature reserve. Go to Tobago. There's a road that runs right through it from Bloody Bay to Roxborough. Straight through that nature reserve. And you can drive through and enjoy it like you can enjoy it nowhere else in the Caribbean. It's a tourist attraction. Tourists come on the cruise ship. They get into a maxi and they go for a drive through the rainforest. You think if we had tried to build that road today, we could have done so? Hmm? They would have stopped it. They would have stopped it. I was in California in September, one of my favorite locations when I go to visit my cousins. I go to Inyo National Forest. Inyo National Forest is a unique piece of forest in California, a park. You drive for about 25 miles on a four-lane highway through it. Drive straight through it. There's a, 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 an old volcanic site there where you can see old volcanoes and old lava flows and so on. It's a scientific site, a scientific reserve, but you drive to it comfortably. But in Trinidad and Tobago, many of them who don't even know what they're talking about. I heard Dan Osuku talking about we're going to build house, uh, cutting down orange trees in, in, um, in Curiep, and Curiep is a source of germplasm. Let me just tell you what they're talking about. The germplasm meaning the, 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 the live plants, the stock, the livestock, the stock of life in the plant that you use to propagate to make other plants. I am the only prime minister of this country who ever had and has an agriculture advisor to the prime minister. You all know that? I brought Dr. John Allen here. I twisted his arm and got him to give up his job in Florida and come home to spend some time with us. And he's working out of the office of the Prime Minister as an advisor to the Prime Minister. It is Dr. John Allen. We are on a, we are on a field trip to MAPA because we want to target to produce a million plants. Because if you don't have planting material, all this talk and talk about agriculture, half of them never sweat yet. They never get their hands dirty in dirt yet, but they know about, talk about agriculture. Without farmers, you can't have no agriculture. And in the absence of farmers, it's only old talk. And they can't talk to me because I am a registered farmer of long vintage. So when I brought Dr. Alin here and I go out there, and I look among the, we aim to have a million plants, both tree crops and food crops, timber plants and, 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 and food crops. I saw these little orange plants looking variegated. And I said, Doctor, what is going on here? And he looked at it and he said, we got a problem. He said, this is not iron deficiency. This looks like a disease, and if it is what it is, we got a problem. And he went about to investigate it, and it turns out that we have in this country something called citrus greening. It's called dragon disease, come out of China. And what that does, it converts all the leaves on an orange on a citrus plant into green and yellow, and the fruits turn bitter, and there's no cure. And if you don't clean up what is there, it propagates and spreads throughout the whole country. We had to destroy over 200,000 plants. And you know where that came from? The celebrated germ plasma in St. Augustine. The nursery. The same nursery that Anosuko and Vasanbara are telling us to preserve because of our future in agriculture. While Vasan Bharat was agriculture minister, they were propagating citrus greening in, in, in um, protecting citrus greening in St. Augustine. We brought in experts. The experts told us, destroy those orange trees immediately and destroy all the planting material and bring in, we are in the process now of bringing in from external healthy, non-disease stock to restart our citrus industry in this country. But it, you know, the, the French have a way of saying the more things change, the more it remains the same. The same thing happened with cattle, you know. Right now as I speak to you, we have probably thousands of heads of cattle, Buffalypso, 
carrying a disease, brucellosis, that they brought into this country, went abroad and bought a stock of animals with brucellosis, bring it here and propagated it in the farm. And instead of destroying the animals when they were found to have the disease, they have them, they're mollycoddling them. And of course, we can't propagate. We can't propagate the animals because they are infected with the disease that came in here very carelessly. That is their record in agriculture. But they are our advisors. They are our advisors. And trying to give you the impression that we don't know what we are doing. When I saw Sister Greening here, I asked John, I said, how long this has been going on? He said, well, we don't know. I said, go to Tobago and see if Tobago has it. Went to Tobago. Guess what? It's in Tobago too. They inoculate the whole country with it. So all our citrus is now in danger. And we're dealing with that. And not the foolishness that Dano Sukwa and Basan Bara are talking about. Because they are looking for the 15 minutes of news and 15 minutes of fame while we are looking after the future of the people of Trinidad and Tobago. <laughs> Only yesterday, the board of Petrotrin, yesterday, the board of Petrotrin told the parliament that action begins with respect to the remodeling of Petrotrin to give our oil company a chance to continue to perform and to perform in such a way that it does not have to depend on the Minister of Finance for its existence. These are the kinds of changes we are making in this country. These are the kinds of far-reaching actions of your government to give us a future. And at the end of the day, at the end of the day, we would have taken this difficult period. We would have sharpened our wits. We would have done what had to be done to get out of these stormy waters to move into karma sailing of progress ahead of us. And the only political party in this country with a history of doing things like that for the people of Trinidad and Tobago is the People's National Movement. So tonight, I want to thank all of you for coming out here in your large numbers and for standing with the government that you've elected and for understanding what we are doing and what has to be done because it is our intention to continue to do what you elect us to do which is to put your interests first and to put Trinidad and Tobago in a place where your children can have a future. Thank you for coming out. Thank you for supporting your MP and thank you for waiting us, walking with us through this very difficult period because it would not be the first time that a patient would be on the bed and the doctor is coming to administer the medication to bring about the healing and patients have been known to fight and slap the doctor and the nurse. To all those who have a lot to say about the government, they say it because we are doing what has to be done and a lot of what has to be done is not painless. Thank you and good night. Great is the PNM. Great is the PNM. Great is the PNM and we shall prevail. <laughs>